Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar covering manufacturing visualization uh, with Iris Custom Solutions. Uh, we have special guests today, um, Mr. Rob Fell and Karen Hod Hodgson. Uh, hopefully I pronounced those right. And uh, we're going to get uh, started here. Uh, some quick logistics before we get going. Um, we are going to, uh, so in this, in this webinar, uh, we can't hear you. So if you have any questions, put those into the uh, chat panel or the Q&A panel, and we'll try to get to those either during the webinar or at the end where there's a question and answers uh, section. Uh, so for today's agenda, um, uh, first of all, my name is Scott Cortier, and I'm going to be uh, doing a brief introduction, kind of as I'm doing now, and then a brief uh, IndieSoft overview, just a, few, a handful of slides before I hand it over to uh, Rob and Karen. Uh, then they'll do uh, a quick overview of what they're going to cover, talk about their manufacturing visualization system, and then we'll open it up at the end for questions and answers. Uh, again, uh, we're going to be recording this uh, webinar, and we're recording now, and uh, posting it on the website in just a couple of days. So if you, if you want to go back to it and take a look at it, uh, please feel free to do that. Also, we've got uh, approximately 130 of these webinars recorded on our website covering almost every topic that you can imagine. So if you've got questions, uh, issues, want to take a look at something, uh, feel free to take a look at the webinars on our website, and uh, hopefully they'll help you out. If not, to, when we send you out a survey, fill out a, uh, the, that questionnaire and, and uh, let us know what topics you'd like to know more about. Uh, we'd love to, to hear from you and, uh, uh, and do more on those topics that you're interested in. Uh, also, uh, if you send us in that survey your, your shirt size uh, and address, we'll send you a free t-shirt just for joining us today. We really appreciate it. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, for those of you who haven't uh, uh, been on one of our webinars before or don't know mo so much about IndieSoft, uh, just a quick little overview. We, were, we started in the U.S. in 97, and uh, now we're part of Schneider Electric Software, uh, yet we still maintain our very customer-focused culture. As kind of these webinars uh, uh, indicate, we, we listen to our customers, we put on these webinars and cover topics uh, specifically that, that you request, you and, and the rest of our, our customer base request. Uh, if you didn't know this, we were one of the first uh, products uh, available on Windows CE for HMI and SCADA. And why is that important? Well, Windows CE is kind of a smaller, lower-end operating system, and it, it, it helps us keep our focus on very high performance, very low footprint uh, uh, software, and uh, therefore it makes a very high performance uh, uh, software for, for you. Um, if you didn't know this, uh, we have multi-touch support and HTML5 integration, and why is that important? Because now that opens it up to being able to view the screens and interact with them on things like uh, iPads, Android phones, tablets, uh, desktops, things of that nature, any HTML5 browser. Uh, also, we now have a, a product that we're calling IoT View uh, for the industrial Internet of Things, and it allows you to run on Linux platforms. Uh, so we've got a couple of web webinars that we've done on that, so if you have any questions, let us know. Um, we've won numerous awards, uh, as you can probably see here, uh, quite a few with Control Engineering. Um, and uh, if you didn't know this, uh, this this award is actually voted on by by um, subscribers to the magazine like yourselves, and uh, that's why we're really proud of it because it's not voted on based on advertising dollars. And if you didn't know this, uh, we're up for the 2017 award. Uh, so please feel free to go to Control Engineering and uh, vote for us. And if you're not uh, currently a subscriber, feel free to sign up to the magazine and then vote for us. So we'd really appreciate that. Uh, so let's talk just a couple of quick slides about the product before I hand it over to uh, Rob and Karen. If you're not familiar with IndieSoft Web Studio, it's a very easy to use yet still very powerful and affordable HMI and SCADA software. Well, why do I talk about it like that? Well, there's uh, quite a few people that I've talked to that maybe only know IndieSoft as a low-end uh, HMI and maybe those who only know us as a high-end SCADA system. Uh, so what I wanted to talk about that it's a very scalable product. You can develop low, low, low end HMI, maybe single screen applications, uh, doing some simple communications with the PLC, on up to very, very huge uh, installations. We support over 10 or up to 10 million tags uh, and uh, 32 simultaneous drivers. So, so lots of good things. Uh, a very scalable product there. Um, it can run on any Microsoft operating system, including Windows CE. Windows Embedded, Windows Desktop and Server Edition. So 
uh, desktop being you know, so Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 10, as well as the current server editions, and now even Linux and VxWorks, and, and we're heading into that other operating system support as well. Uh, so one of the things that we've done over the last few years is, is uh, if you take a look at this little pyramid here, down at the bottom, uh, you know, customers will use our product as an HMI product, as a SCADA product, and develop their own projects. And then we've also come up with some industry-specific uh, templates, uh, which I'll show you in the next slide. And then, you know, customers can then customize those. You can deploy this really in any way that you want to. Customers can create everything themselves. They can use one of our templates uh, or customize one of our templates and, and do their own thing completely. Uh, built into our uh, demo that gets installed with a product, you're going to find a very simple packaging uh, PacML demo uh, a template and an OEE template, which is a very simple one. Uh, you're going to see what Rob and Karen present is a much more elaborate, much more full-featured uh, uh, overall uh, equipment effectiveness type uh, uh, template and project. So I'll let them I'll let them talk more about their product here in a minute. And uh, also in that is an and on our production monitoring system uh, template. These are really just kind of single screens. Uh, we do have an Andon template if you're interested in that. We also have a webinar that covers that. Uh, let us know if you're interested in any of those, but those are all built into our, our standard demo. With that, uh, I'm going to go hand it over to uh, Karen and Rob. Great. Sounds good. Thanks, Scott. And, uh, you know, thanks to IndieSoft for hosting us today and, and as well as all the in attendees uh, this morning or this afternoon, depending on, on where you're from. So. We're going we're gonna to take it easy on you guys. We've only got uh, a couple free uh, PowerPoint slides, and then we're going to get right into the application itself and, and share that with you today. So uh, just a couple things as far as who Iris is. Uh, our background, you know, really we're, we're a specialist in machine vision control and data collection. Uh, where we kind of cut our teeth on EduSoft was, you know, in, in our market space in the custom vision arena, we found that, there were a lot of customers that, you know, they wanted the vision system to work, but they didn't necessarily, you know, want that as their main screen. And, and furthermore, we felt as though that they could use machine vision as a root cause analysis tool. So where we started with IndieSoft was really writing custom front ends uh, with different vision platforms, Keyins, Cognex, Omron, you know, you name it, where we could provide a very user-friendly and informative front end that kind of hid somewhat of a complicated machine vision program in the background. So customers responded really well to that uh, as far as the, the data that we were giving them and the format that we were giving it to them. Uh, and at that point we said, hey, let's, let's look at this for, you know, situations where maybe there's not machine vision. It's just the, um, you know, the machine itself. And in that case, we started to look a little bit as to, you know, what would be considered, you know, somewhat industry standard as far as a metric on how to evaluate equipment, and OEE was a, a pretty obvious uh, choice for us. So, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, OEE specifically in just a second, but uh, what we decided to do is, is take it a step further in that there are a lot of OEE packages out there. The difference in, in where we kind of rolled it into this manufacturing visualization system is that IndoSoft along with our controls competencies, really allow us to turn an OEE application into something that becomes much more granular in that we're actually monitoring, you know, specific conditions and information that reside within the PLC. So if you've looked at OEE applications in general, you'll find a lot of them are uh, either calculating information as a result of, of user inputted information or they do some simple things like, you know, put a sensor on a, on a machine or a sensor on a rejector, and they're really looking for a heartbeat, and they're looking for, you know, rejects, and then they, they maybe add in their availability or, or maybe not. What we do is we want to tell you why, because in, in a day of everyone says data, 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 but in reality, if you're not getting anything out of it and it's not detailed enough for you to do anything about it, in our opinion, it's not valuable. So if you say, oh, my machine's up or my machine's down, so what? We want to tell you why it's up and why it's down and what fault condition led to it and what operator was running the machine and what product were you running when that happened and, and, and so on and so forth. So that's really the evolution of us migrating OEE 
uh, into what we call uh, MVS. So, um, I, and again, as Scott mentioned, I'd welcome, please, this is your presentation. I, I'd ask that you, you know, be uh, liberal with your, your question asking and, and we'll be sure to address things as they come up or at the end at least. So, uh, so just to get into OEE a little bit, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with it, um, you know, let's go, actually go one more slide, Karen, and then we'll go, then we'll go back. Okay. So OEE is ultimately a calculation of availability times performance times quality. And within each one of those, you know, there's, there's sub-calculations that ultimately lead to a, a decimal or a percentage uh, that you roll into your total OEE number. At a higher level, OEE is ideal versus actual when looking at how often is the machine running versus how often it should be, how fast is it running versus how fast it should be, and what are my quality numbers? You know, what, what's my yield? Ultimately, what am I putting out uh, with regards to good product versus overall product? So very simply, OEE is a measure of ideal versus actual, okay? So can I just scroll back up there? So why would you want to know this? Again, going back to why is the data useful? You know, when you, when you look at the decisions facing manufacturing, you know, you start to look at, you know, first of all, am I making product fast enough? So am I, am I utilizing my equipment to its, its fullest capability? Um, what's, what's happening as I start to run faster? Am I, am I sacrificing quality? And am I able to capture that and watch what's happening and, and manage scrap uh, in terms of, you know, how fast my machine's running? Um, what's happening upstream and downstream? I'll give you an example. You know, we have a, a client that's in the closure industry where, you know, they may have uh, an error code that comes up on, on one of three cells that make up this line that says, hey, we're not, we're not receiving caps, okay? I can't run because there's no cap availability. But in reality, because we're monitoring all three cells, we're looking even further back into the hopper to say, oh, there's a hopper jam. Or maybe even further back to say the, the press is down. So, you know, that's the, the type of information I'm talking about as far as, you know, looking upstream and downstream. And then a big part is, you know, as you're considering either decommissioning equipment or purchasing more equipment, it may be worth an intermediary investment to say, hey, what, you know, do I need this? Can I get 10% more productivity out of these other, you know, four machines as opposed to having to, you know, purchase a, a new one that I may only need to run half the time right now? So. You know, those are just some of the things that, that are important is regard, you know, with regards to why you may actually want to deploy a system, you know, like this. So as far as where you can get the information, you can take this information, as Scott talked about, you know, whether it's, we kind of say on the floor, uh, in the front office, or on the go is, is what we say. So, you know, in the front office is if we want to have information, and you'll see the application in just a minute here, where it's sitting in front of a production manager, operation manager, uh, a floor level technician, you want it sitting on a desktop or multiple desktops, certainly possible. Uh, if you want some interfaces down on the floor, either at the operator level or overhead in, in the uh, translation of what ultimately is an and on screen, uh, you can certainly do that. And then we can take it to the point where it's, it's you know, producing information on laptops and tablets and other mobile devices. I guess let's go right into the probably the application, I would say, at this point. Um, so also, too, just a, a quick uh, acknowledgement. I, you know, I want to, you know, thank our team as well, and, and Karen especially, for really spearheading, you know, this. We, we took what was a, um, kind of what Scott referred to as, you know, a nuts and bolts OEE application that Ingusoft offered. And uh, then we took it to, you know, the, the level that it is today. So. What we're going to do is we're going to walk you through uh, the application as if you were to set it up, you know, for the first time and, um, you know, just give you a general idea of, of what the tools are that are available. Uh, the one unique thing that, that the reason we chose Indusoft specifically is not only because of its ability to talk to, I think there's maybe over 230 or so native drivers, so we can talk to nearly any control platform, but also, it's customization. So, uh, with again a lot of larger, you know, OEE type applications and SCADA applications, uh, companies are are slow to move and, and expensive for changes. But you know, IndieSoft gives us the flexibility to make changes 
uh, quickly. And Iris as an organization, you know, being as though we're not a, a, a monster company, you know, we can typically take something in and turn it back out relatively quickly. So if there's something that you don't see here and you say, I wonder if it can do that, throw it up on the, on the Q&A and, and we're happy to address that. So, so this main screen, we'll, we'll do a quick overview of, of what that main screen is and, um, and then we'll dive into some of the individual uh, selections here. So, you know, this is really what, what we would consider to be the, the, the splash screen for the application. And our goal with, uh, with each of the screens and the reports that we're going to show you is uh, kind of the three-second rule. If you can't look at a report or some bit of information and in three seconds know whether something is good or bad, then the report is too complicated or too diluted. So when we approach this, you know, we looked at it again, being as though we're manufacturing people and we're controls people, we know the environment, we know, you know, quality and, and how important it is and productivity. We wanted this to be a tool for everybody, for the operator, for the, you know, for the plant floor technician, all the way up to the, the operations manager and, and the quality department. So, um, so starting, I guess, uh, you know, clockwise from, let's say, the data section here, uh, what we've done is created two distinct areas. Data is really where you're going to go to find the information that you want. Set, um, I, I lied to you. I'm going to go counterclockwise for a minute. <laughs> setup is really where we would do all the initial setup and configuration. Immediately below the setup, you'll see this is where the line information is. So within one application, you can click on individual lines or individual cells within those lines to get information, you know, literally at the cell level. So it's not just OEE. From a macro level, it's OE and, and MVS from a very micro level. So, and we'll talk a little bit about how that information changes as we go. Um, the main, let's say, center of the screen here, what you're seeing is really the, the availability, performance, and, and quality individually, and then how they roll up into uh, the total OEE number. Uh, the target OEE is something that you would set as a reference point. And your actual OEE is, is really the number that's most important to you um, that you'll see both in the bar graph and in the upper right-hand corner there. The production statistics is uh, sort of a, a quick splash, you know, within a splash screen of this is what I've made. You know, this is what I made. This is how many times I've rejected uptime and downtime. And the interesting thing about this is as you go to the center of this page and you're allowed to pick uh, different dates and, and times, what will actually happen is, you know, you can go ahead and, and select the date and time, update it, and then you can see that information all changes now. So this is not just a, a, a live, you know, feed. Really, it can serve as a historian for you to go back and say, well, you know, what is it under these conditions? What is it with this particular product, you know, that I'm running right now? You can actually select the product if you wanted to and see that change. What shift? You can go to certain hotkeys of, you know, last four hours, last two hours. So, again, it's not just information now. It's really information uh, historically as well as we're ultimately storing this all in a database. In the bottom right-hand corner, you can see that we can export data. So, you know, there's, there's going to be somebody at your facility that says, this is great. I love it. I love the custom reports, but give me the data. Spit this information out in a CSV file. Let me parse through it. And, and make decisions on, you know, what I want to I wanna be able to do, you know, with this information, okay? All right, so let's go into the general configuration. So for OEE to be a true OEE application, you need to address the individual items of availability, performance, and quality. So the availability portion, you know, we found uh, kind of nosing around at other applications tends to get cheated a little bit. Um, you know, typically someone will say, hey, here's an eight-hour shift. You know, let's look at this. Uh, you know, we start at 6 in the morning. We're done at 2. That's our eight-hour shift. Our availability for that time is eight hours. Well, that's not necessarily the case almost ever. I mean, you know as manufacturers that uh, you're going to have breaks. Potentially, there's going to be times your machine is up and down. And, again, keeping in mind availability is – when is it up or down, your machine, as opposed to when it should be up or down? So in these cases, what we allow you to do is enter individual shifts, start time, end time, and then ultimately you're able to enter specific down times where you know that machine is supposed to be down. Again, we don't want to count that as downtime if it's really not 
downtime. And that's the important thing to get a real true reflection of what your OEE is. We have certain customers where maybe that shift changes. On, one, on week one, that shift is one thing. And on week two, that shift is something different. And then you can, you know, check box where we can go into and say, that, you know, here's the individual days associated with it as well. So, again, we give a lot of control over how you can set this information up because it's, you know, I, I love the, the, the term kind of garbage in, garbage out. If you're, if you're not producing detailed information on the front end, then you're not going to get accurate information on the back end. So once you've done this, simply save and close. And you can go ahead and enter as many shifts as you want in, in information that you need to. So now we'll go into the, the performance aspect. So performance is really uh, your part per minute actual versus your part per minute ideal. So to be able to calculate that, we need to know what your part per minute ideal really is. So again, to be able to go and look at from a very granular perspective of what your uh, performance metrics are and, and attribute that to certain products and other machine conditions, we're going to enable you to actually enter individual products and not only look at, hey, is this one machine running at a certain rate, but is this one machine and this one product running as it should be? So you can see now Karen's actually entering information, entering a new product, entering parts per minute, and then we can go ahead and add that product. It's that easy. Um, this is a manual way to do it. If you said, hey, uh, we've already got a database of, you know, 3,000 products, we'd prefer to not enter it, we would tell you, great, send us that database, and we'll go ahead and import that information for you so you don't necessarily have to enter it all manually. The point in all this is we've talked to customers specifically that have rolled out large SCADA MES and, and in turn OEE applications and the feedback is always the same. It took a long time, it was really expensive, and I now have to literally have a database expert on staff to be able to manage this. We took all of that out. So if you have a database expert, that's great. But as far as what we require to interface with the system to be able to input information and extract information out, we literally have set it up so nearly anybody can do it. Okay, so once we've identified performance, then look. And the other thing I wanted to just add real quick is um, then when, um, in order to get that parts per minute, you would just select whichever product you're running, um, which tells the application, you know, which value to use for that calculation. Yeah, so great point, Karen. So two ways to do this. Um, if you wanted to have somebody select this at the machine, select it in the front office, or again, with this system, we're typically very integrated to both your control system and in some cases your, say your front end job management tool. Uh, as an example, we just did a, a project for a metal stamper that used a, a project called Job Boss. And what we would do is we would just go get it. So we'd say, okay, we're gonna, they're about to run. And then we would say, okay, great, let's go get the information from your database. I now know that this is what you're running. Um, this is the raw material coming in, this is the part that you're going to run, this is the rate, and so on. So, uh, again, we can either go get that information if you have it available, or if you don't, then we can go ahead and have you enter it. And, and bear in mind, that, not to get too off topic here, the market for this is these are not the, necessarily the, the crafts and the Pepsis and the Cokes. They certainly could use it. We wanted to produce a tool that whether you have one machine, or three machines, or a hundred machines, that you could deploy this in a way that's that's user friendly and and cost effective without making a fundamental infrastructure change to the way that you go about your business. Okay, so keep in mind that the design and the thought process behind this was making it appealing to that customer. So if you're on the phone right now and and you're a plant with you know you're a, an injection molder with six presses and and some downstream equipment, that's great. If, if you're a guy that's, uh, that's uh, even a machine shop that says, hey, I want to watch how often my, my CNC machine is running, and I just want to put this on that one machine and understand if, is it time for me to buy a, a, another piece of equipment or, or, or no? You know, do I have a little bit of availability here on the one I have? Or I'm four different plants, 
and I've got 150 different pieces of equipment, and I'd like this application to run at each plant and give information accordingly and tie that all into to one roll-up to understand how my plants are performing, you can do that as well. Again, it's the scalability that Indusoft offers uh, and affords us to be able to extend to our clients, and it's the way we built the application as well. So as far as the quality portion of it, and, and that was uh, the reason I brought that up as kind of a segue into this, there's the manufacturing visualization portion of this kind of starts here. So when we talk about quality, there's a couple ways we can get it. Again, there's a lot of applications that allow you to take your bin, weigh it, great, I've got, you know, 65 pounds of, uh, you know, caps or something like that, and I can manually enter that information, and that's fine. So we can afford you the opportunity to do that here where, you know, if you say, I don't, I don't have a vision system, I don't have specific error codes, I don't really have a way to figure out um, why a part was bad, I just rejected it or maybe it was something manual that happens, an operator inspects it and they reject it. We allow you to go ahead and enter that information and your, your own information, by the way, to say, hey, these are your, let's say, 10 top rejects and I'm going to go ahead and enter those in and then when I have a reject, I'm going to allow my operator to either enter it at the time and say this is why this failed or do something post-mortem to sort through rejects and say I had, you know, 10 of these, 3 of these, 4 of these. Then, you know, what we want to do is, again, we want to accumulate that. So when you go to our reject statistics screen, and whether this is a result of manual or automated input, this is where you can look and say, hey, this is a breakdown of my rejects now. This is the, the, the part where we're kicking it off the machine. This is why we're, you know, why we're turning it out. And in the case of um, a more automated setup where we're speaking directly to a PLC or a vision system, for example, we can go ahead and, and really any information that's available in the PLC, we can go ahead and get it and extract it and say, oh, this, this was kicked off at this point in the machine and at this time, and it was for this very specific reason uh, per the vision system or per the machine control. So um, if you don't want to do it manually, uh, you know, which we would advise, obviously, the, the more automated the better, we can go ahead and, and dive in and get that information and, and populate it and quantify it. So. Those are really the two ways that we're really addressing quality here is that, is that third metric, okay? So how does that translate? That's the key, okay? So we've got all this information, great. Now, what do we do with it? So let's go into, Karen, we go into the reporting for just a minute. So again, as Karen said, you know, as you, I guess, as, you, as we go to set up, let's go select product for a minute. Okay. So as we go to set up, we're simply going to pick a product, and hit run, and as you know, we've already set up the other things. We've already set up the ability to enter different quality metrics, and the system already knows what shift it is. So that's it. So you're literally saying, I'm about to run. This is the product I'm about to run. And we can set up prompts if you say, hey, I, I want you to prompt me when a, a shift starts or a shift ends to say, you know, a prompt my operator or prompt someone to say, hey, let's make sure we change this if we're not going and doing that automatically. So, you know, there's some customization there that, that we can certainly do. So once you're running, this is really where the, the, the rubber hits the road in the reporting. And again, that, that flexibility that Indusoft gives us is, you know, anything that we're reaching out and touching in the controls or gathering in the application, we can display. So these are just a few examples, but, you know, I ask you to, to picture in your own mind what would be most valuable to you? Is it, you know, looking at how individual machines compare to one another, looking how plants compare to one another, how operators compare to one another, you know, what is this product, how does it perform over another product? Those are, those are all things that because we're gathering it, we can certainly display it. So let's go into some of the more customized reports. So for example, rejects by type. You know, I think this is, again, the, the three second rule, right? If you, if you haven't seen something in three seconds, you know it's right or wrong you know, we haven't done our job. And, and here's an example of that. You know, the top left corner, you can look and say, hey, you know, yesterday, these were my top five reject reasons. And in this case, maybe there were only three. And again, because we know specifically why it's rejecting and we're quantifying that, we're displaying that information accordingly, okay? And then we'd also, you know, give it, and you could tell us this, you'd say, well, I, I wanna know, you know, my hotkeys to be not only yesterday, but I want to look at last shift, you know, last two shifts, last four shifts, et cetera, 
the time delimiters are are really completely up to you. In this case, we chose, you know, last week, last month, you know, today, this week, this month kind of thing. And again, you can you can take a look and say, well, wait a minute, you know, why is um, and in this case, just you know, unknown reason, we have some customers who literally they have kind of a category to say, hey, this is this is an unknown reason, but it was a reject, so we need to count that. So if you're if you're wondering what unknown reason is, but um, you know part damaged, uh, you know, a specific part missing, and you say, wait a minute, that's popping up in a lot of different areas. This is something we need to address. So again, the information is only as good as what you can do about it. So that's why we try to display it that way. So if we go back into our reports and we say downtime by type, here, especially if we're in and talking to the, the individual PLCs, we're quantifying by error code in your PLC why your, your machine's telling us it's down to the second, to the minute, and then we're tracking that specific error code and populating that into this, this report. And you can look at it and say, you know, in the case of this closure company that we were talking about, you know, cap runout today has been a problem. I've been down 35 minutes today because of cap runout. Whereas yesterday, my real problem was I didn't have an operator available to run this machine. Why on earth do I not have operators available to run my equipment, right? So, you know, it, it, it allows you to do that day-to-day, -day. what's my problem today while it's happening, not, you know, again, the, the, the companies that are out there that are doing the, the paper reports and we see it all the time and they're hanging on the wall, the problem is that's yesterday's news. That's not what's happening right now. So, and to bring that to that point, you know, most of the time applications like this run in sort of a passive nature. Whereas because of the tying to your machine control and the flexibility in Indusoft, if you say, hey, if I have any alarm that is causing my machine to be down, either X amount of time in the row or some percentage of time, send me an email, flag a stack light, sound an alarm, stop my machine, we can certainly do that. So it's not, hey, what the heck, why, why were we down half the day yesterday? It's why are we down right now, and how do I get a team over there to resolve it? Okay? So that's downtime. Um, so let's go into OEE trends. I think this is, a, this is a good one here. So if you'll see in the, I guess, Karen, first thing would be, let's go ahead and pick some time. So we're going to go ahead and click on our calendar. And then Karen's updating it. And you look at that and say, wow, that's a lot of stuff going on. So let's go ahead and filter that out. And we can look at individual pieces of the graph. So a couple things that are really important here. Again, not to, not to hammer this three-second rule, but, you know, one of the features that we built in that sounds simple, but, you know, it, it plays well, is that the black line that uh, Karen will highlight with her cursor here is a result of the shift information that you entered ahead of time. So what that black line is saying is, I should be down during this time. And the reason that's important is, if you look at, you know, say the area that Karen's pointing to now, that's a problem. I should be up. Black line says I should be running. Blue line says I'm not. That's an issue. I need to look into that. And if you click on the cursor, you'll notice that all the information adjusts and displays according to where that cursor is. Whereas if you look at where the black line and the blue line are dipping together, you say, oh, not a problem. I should be down because that's what that black line is telling me. So if we want to go ahead and take that out and then go ahead to performance, we see similar trends, okay? In the case of the, the green line trending down with the black line, great, that should be happening. In the case of the green line trending down here, we're saying, well, wait a minute, we are not running, we're either down or we're not running nearly as fast as we, as we should be. And then again, with the reporting functions, we can go back in and, and take a look and, and understand what the, what the data is that's actually, you know, what's happening at that point. Looking back at, um, you know, a table to say, okay, great, I know at this time, so let's go back to my reject table, and I know my reject table, I look at this time and I say, oh, this is why I was down at this specific time for this specific error code. So again, why? We don't want to just tell you what's happening. We want to tell you why it's happening. Um, so that would be the, the general kind of OEE trending screen. 
Uh, the other thing I would I would say here that's important to note, if you said we would love to add a, a, another line in here to show, you know, machine as a function of rate. Remember, these are all in percentage. So you just said, I just want to add another line in here that's a, kind of a trending line of machine rate. You can see as your rate increases or decreases, you can follow other things that are happening as far as availability. Am I running so fast that I'm going down because I'm running out of product that's feeding in, you know? So what if your machine can overrun, but if your if your upstream process is not able to fulfill, it doesn't matter. Or, wow, as I as I watch this machine start to run faster, I'm watching my quality number dip considerably. So now I'm sacrificing quality for speed, and that may not make sense. Okay, so those would be the OEE um, trending screens. And then if you wanted to actually go ahead and, and if we go back to the the main screen and we wanted to export data, we could go ahead and just click on the export data, and then what it would do, we don't have anything in here. Like in this case, we'd say, um, again, let's talk about the market space. If you don't want to be networked, you want a PC that acts as a local server out on your plant floor, and we're talking to four or five pieces of equipment, and your IT people say, I don't want anything on my network, and you know because you've, you've run into the buzzsaw before to say, um, man, every time I try to drop something on my network, IT, you know, uh, kind of puts the stopper to it, we'll say, great, let's put a local server, just a, a, an industrial PC out on the floor, and it'll talk to these 10 machines, and we can see all the information locally or maybe an overhead display. You don't have to put it on your network, which is great. And in this case, you know, someone says, well, I want to export the information. Well, great, what do I do with it? We'll give you the ability, you know, we, we put a little bulkhead on the front of the uh, you know, a little kiosk that we would produce for you. You plug it, excuse me, you plug in a thumb drive, spit this information out to a thumb drive, take it back to your desk. In the case where this is networked, you're sitting at your desk, you get on the screen, whether, you know, a thin client or secure view or however we end up doing it, and you can actually just pull this information out. And again, you don't have to just look at what's on your floor. If you're, if you have a pretty integrated, you know, factory floor, you can look at, you know, in one application, you can look at individual cells and lines at any plant that this is talking to. So, and, again, and, and just to drive home, the more information and the more connectivity we have, the more powerful and informative reports we can produce um, that allow you to, to start to really dive in and, and get into that why portion of the application. So. But Karen, I, I think that would that probably covers it without getting to yep. without uh, getting too detailed. So, so I guess at this point we we kind of intentionally left um, you know some time here at the end you know for questions you know both about the the application or any questions that we want to uh, throw towards Scott and his team about IndieSoft you know specifically. So I would say uh, we're we're pulling up the Q and A screen right now. And, I, so I and I'm stealing uh, presentation status from you. So um, I don't know if you guys had any more like a, a contact slide or anything, and, and I can give it back to you if you want, but I was going to leave it on uh, uh, our, our kind of Q&A slide. Yeah, so I'll tell you what I'll do. Um, you know, it's a good, good point. You'll be coming, like tech, tech people, right? We come in here to <laughs> just talk about how cool our stuff is and, and don't give any information on how to get a hold of us. So, um, so I want to talk about one thing. And, and it, is a is a follow up to that, Scott. Uh, the one thing that we would welcome is, so software companies and OEE companies are synonymous with, hey, here is our here's our software, here's your cost, and then by the time you get it deployed, it's it's many times more than that. So um, what we'll do is uh, we'll put together a slide, I guess, Scott, while you're talking, and then we'll, we'll put that information up as far as contact information goes. Um, we have a survey that we put together that what we'll allow you to do is, is we'll send it off to you and then give us a quick snapshot of, of what you're, you're interested in um, and a little bit about, you know, what your needs are. And then we'll go ahead and respond, and, and we can even give you some budgetary pricing information and such. We really like to look at it holistically because these applications are really not just about software. And another thing that we, we bring to the table here is that we're controls people and we're hardware people and we build automated machinery and we get that. So, you know, 
we're going to ask you, you know, where do you want the information? Do you have a server? Do you want something on your plant floor? Um, all those types of questions. And then we can, we can start a, a dialogue about pricing and things like that. And when we give you a price, that'll be the price. You know, so I, I just wanted to, Scott, you kind of walked us into that a little bit as far as future contact goes. We'd welcome anyone to, to reach out to us. Uh, we really are, are unbounded as far as, you know, where we work. We, you know, are, are mostly uh, North and South America, but we certainly, uh, you know, have worked in, in Europe and are willing to work in Europe as well if we have any European attendees here. Um, Scott, if you want to switch to our uh, general screen here, our, our screen for just one second, it, it has a little um, snippet of our contact information. Yep, switching back now. Give me a second here. Um, while we're doing, oh, go ahead. I'll, I'll let you show this, and then I'll, I'll pose some questions and add some comments. Yeah, two All seconds right, here. So I guess. Uh, great. So, so everyone who's here, uh, stay tuned. We'll probably shoot you an email as a follow-up within a week or so. Uh, our current website uh, is uh, is is pretty stagnant. Uh, we really haven't done what we should have, you know, to, to get it updated. We're about a, a week away from launching our new website, which will have a bunch of information about vision and OEE and equipment and things like that. So uh, don't uh, don't judge us too quickly on our current website. We'll get that off to you shortly here. Uh, best information, our, our general number is the number ending in 7700. Uh, if you'd like to reach me directly, I would be the, the main point of contact as far as pricing and in collaboration with our team. And that number would just end in 7702. So that would be 630-634-7702. And you could either reach us at info at irisscs.com or sales at irisscs.com. And uh, for those of you who don't know uh, where Woodridge, Illinois is, we're about 35 to 40 minutes southwest of Chicago. So we're pretty centrally located here in the States. Great. Uh, Rob, Karen, thanks. You know, I, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, I, I want to make sure everybody realizes is you're talking about not having the website where it, where it should be. I, I want to make sure everybody realizes that, uh, that Rob, I know uh, I've known you for a while. I know you've got a, a, a lot of automation experience and a lot of history. Uh, I, I, I think I've seen some information on Karen and that uh, she also has a lot of history. And I know one of your partners. Uh, I think Mike uh, has got a lot of automation history. You guys, you guys got to, you know, uh, total up that history, and and that's that's a a, a long, uh, you know, lots of experience on your on your plate there. Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, we, we certainly and we need to represent that better. But um, but I just want to I want to thank uh, you know before we get into the questions, I just want to thank everybody for uh, for listening. We love sharing what we've done. Um, we really uh, have have enjoyed using IndieSoft specifically for, for those of you who are out there right now who are interested in this specific application, uh, I would welcome you to, to contact us. And for those of you who are interested in IndieSoft, I, I will tell you as, a, as a, uh, an organization who's used IndieSoft for a long time, the benefits that they offer in, in flexibility, in commercial scalability, and, and very, I, I think the one thing that, that maybe goes untold a little bit, their ability to talk to machines is second to none. And, you know, if you think about it, IndieSoft was really kind of developed as a standalone platform. So different than the, the factory talks and the, the interlutions of the world, you know, they don't really have a, a hardware backbone to fall back on to say, oh, yeah, this is, we talk to our hardware, this is what we do. So they really kind of by nature of their business, they need to talk to everybody, and they do an excellent job of doing that. And, and when we look at, you know, the, the progression of the Internet of Things, especially that moves into the industrial space, you know, companies like IndieSoft and applications like what we produced are only going to further the ability to go out and speak to each one of those individual devices and collect information from them to start to really better understand what's going on. So, so thanks again to, to Scott and IndieSoft, and thanks again for everybody who uh, attended today. And, uh, you know, we'd, we'd open it up to, to any questions at this point. Yeah, so so continuing on with um, what Rod just said, we're we're open to questions, and and for those of you who didn't hear the first part of the webinar, uh, we can't hear you uh, on this type of webinar. So if you have any questions, put them into the chat panel or the Q and A panel on the WebEx interface, and we'll we'll uh, we'll get those answered. Rob, I want to make a couple of comments, and then uh, and then ask you a couple of questions myself. 
Uh, I know often when I talk about OEE and present about it, uh, I bring up a concept of, of you know, it, it's really, and, and you guys presented this really well, and I like the, the look of your, your uh, uh, MVS. Uh, I like the uh, concept of it. Uh, but uh, uh, when I talk about it, it's, it's okay, we've got to uh, see where are those problems, where's that low-hanging fruit. And, and when you're talking about a manufacturing system, when you're talking about a machine, uh, I throw out an idea often of, of a machine is really just a printing press for money. Uh, you're making a profit off, off of what is coming out of the other end of that machine, and if it's uh, not running, uh, well, you're not printing money. And when you when you think about it that way, when I when I presented it that way, a lot of people go, "Wow, you know, I've never really looked at it that way." Uh, uh, so so you know, that's just kind of a concept to keep in mind there. Um, one of the other things that I'd like to bring up is is um, and maybe you can elaborate on this, Rob. What I've seen is people will often implement OEE kind of in phases. And, and maybe the first phase is a very simple, maybe they don't have to make any changes to the PLC ladder logic. They can just measure what they can measure by adding this type of product, the, the MVS system to, to an application and, and see what they can get. And then further going granular and maybe adding some extra logic to then measure some other things. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, you bet. So, so there's really two things there and you bring up a good point. There are, um, some cases, in, and we have kind of different, let's say, versions of this, where uh, the customer just says, hey, you know what, I, I do want to be that company for right now, just to let's figure out what what my big problems are, the kind of the low-hanging fruit that you're referring to, where let, let's go ahead and just monitor a couple sensors on the machine. You know, let's watch my machine stroke. You know, let's watch the amount of rejects that are getting kicked off, and, and let's grab that information at a real high level first. Um, and then they progress to the to the machine control side of it. And one thing I wanted to, to talk about a little bit, and you, you made a point there, I want to be clear to the audience. Uh, most of the time, we don't need to make any change to the PLC program at all. We just need to know where, where stuff is. So for those of you thinking, oh, I don't want anyone getting in my PLC program, we don't need to get in and change anything. We just need to get in and, and say, where is this information at? And, it, you know, as you know, Scott, we can just kind of go and, and, and get it. So there's no fundamental change to the program, uh, but certainly, you know, there's, there's a, a path here. And I'll give you a, a very specific example that I refer to that metal stamping customer uh, earlier today. You know, he is a customer with three plants and, you know, 40-some presses. And, you know, the progression for him was, uh, you know, the problem there, think of a metal stamping press, a lot of those have no control at all. So what we did is said, okay, you know what, we'll give you a little individual HMI and a little Mitsubishi PLC or, you know, whatever PLC you want and a couple sensors, and we're just going to watch stroke. And we're going to watch parts getting kicked out. And I'll tell you why that was super valuable to him. Now, for that particular client, he brings a roll of steel up to his press. And then... What he knows is that machine is going to run, and I use that term loosely, but it's, gonna, it's allocated to run for eight hours. And at the end of eight hours, he knows that he's got, you know, 2,000 parts to show for it. But up until this point, he didn't really know if of an eight-hour shift, that, that press was down four hours. So in reality, he, if he was better, he could have gotten that, that run done in four. Uh, he doesn't know if he made 2,000, but he kicked off, you know, 200, didn't know that. So, you know, that's the, that's the, the big hitter for him now. And then it's going to be, all right, well, let's look at our operator productivity. Let's have people badge in and badge out. You know, let's look at tracking coils and knowing that, hey, this coil has run 2,000 parts. I should get 5,000 parts out of that coil. And I know that I have a 2,500-part run coming up. I've logged that coil in my database along with the application so I can say, okay, cool. Before I, I turn into a new coil and have two coils that are, are half or 40% used, let's go find that coil back in the back room that I know has got another 3,000 parts left on it, and let's run that out. So that's kind of the next iteration for them. So, so absolutely, you can start small, start on one machine, start on three machines, you know, start with a couple sensors, figure out where your problems are, and then progress from there. 
Okay, great. Uh, we have a, a, a question from the audience. I think it's, it's kind of a three-part question. I'll, I'll read them all and then I'll ask them to you one at a time. And you, you kind of have answered those with, with what I just asked, but I'll ask them specifically. Uh, so again, this is three parts here. How often do your customers have the information that you need available for the setup? Uh, next question is how are you, uh, or are you always starting from scratch? And uh, the third piece is, is it a long time to get them going with the software? And, and that was kind of my next question, which is going to be, you know, what's, what's, how long did, does it take before you start to see a return on investment? So let's go back to the first part. How often do your customers have the information that, uh, available for the setup of this? Yeah, so I would, I would segment that into, into two customers. Uh, the customer that's, that's automated, the customer that has a PLC, the customer that's, you know, rejecting parts, um, that, that information is typically very readily available and requires, you know, very little uh, change on, on their part. Uh, if anything, it's a, it's a little deeper dive where they can say, oh, wait a minute, you can, you can talk to my vision system or, you know, you can talk to this other device that is feeding back information. So if anything, there's, there's a little bit of progression there, uh, but typically the automated customer has information that's very readily available. So there's a very fast uh, you know, turn around there as far as be able to get to that information. The other end of the spectrum is that that customer that, that knows they need something like this, but they're very manual and they're very, um, let, you know, let's say their, their equipment uh, is, is somewhat legacy-based. We find that those customers, um, the time is really asking them to kind of reflect on their process to say, all right, what do I want to get out of this and what's important to me? You know, you all know as manufacturers and, and just in general as people, you know, our problems almost become the norm. You know, when you look at, uh, you know, issues, you go, oh, yeah, that, uh, that, that, machine, that happens all the time or, or that, yeah, that machine's always down for that. And, you know, you, know, you don't stop sometimes and go, well, why is that? So, you know, when we think about accessing information um, for the less automated customer, that does typically take a little bit longer, and most of that time is them internally saying, this is what's important to us, and then us responding to them and say, all right, great, this is how we're going to help you to grab that, that information. So hopefully that, that addresses uh, uh, that question. Um, before, and then as far as before the, I ask, you know, I was, Before I ask you the second question, I want to I elaborate on that. I went into a customer one time. And they had really no automation. They had really no quality control. The only way that they knew if they were producing bad parts was if they got them returned back from the customer weeks or months later. It was a little, a little odd. <laughs> um, but then when they implemented IndieSoft in there, they were, they were really surprised at how they could track it and, and see it and then improve upon it right there on the spot. So uh, really good for them. Uh, the, se the second part is, are you always starting from scratch uh, on this? Yeah, so, uh, and just one thing, just to, just to touch on what you just said, Scott. So the other thing that we bring to the table as an organization, you know, for those of uh, you in the audience who are, are looking at Iris as a potential supplier is, you know, for the customer that says, I know I'm rejecting, I'm making bad parts, but I don't know how to get that, you know, it, it, it plays in so naturally that the machine vision side and the, and the inspection side of things where we say, okay, great, before we even worry about collecting information, Let's talk to you guys about how we can identify good and bad parts. That's the big thing, right? So let's look at it and say, let's make sure we're not getting bad parts out to your customer. And then once we've, once we've stopped that bleeding to make sure you're not getting truckloads of parts back or you're, you're manually sorting because you're getting rejected bins back, let's fix that first. And then let's go into the collection side of things to see, you know, how often, when, all that other good stuff. So um, just from an iris perspective, you know, we, we love those customers that, that we can help them twice. You know, we can help them with their quality, and then we can help them with their, with their productivity. So and as far as starting from scratch, uh, the question or the answer is no. Uh, you know, the point of us building this application is that it gets us 90% of the way there really every time. I mean, we've really built a tool to be conducive to this customer or conducive to that customer, and really what we're doing is kind of turning on and turning off different features and functions to – be able to accommodate, let's say, automated, you know, quality metrics where we're pulling out a PLC or maybe it's more manual where we say, okay, this, this person's going to just type in their information. So um, the whole point in developing this is 
you know, producing something for the client that's really most of the way there. And if it, 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 there's a couple things that's important there. A, it allows us to be very competitive. B, is usually by the time someone's interested in this, they've got problems. So it's not like they, you know, they say, oh, great, yeah, we'd love to sit down and develop this for another, you know, 18 months or two years. And no, they, it's just like vision. You know, when we get a call and someone needs a vision system today, it's because they got a call today that their customer's upset because they sent out bad parts. And when we're getting, you know, calls about, you know, this type of information or, or when people see it and they're exposed to it, they're like, I need that now because I've got problems today and I'm losing money today. So the other reason we keep it, you know, relatively standard is because uh, we, we want people to be able to, to deploy this very quickly. So, so that kind of feeds into the last, last part, which yeah, is yeah. Uh, what, what is, how long does it take them to get going or, or really what's the return on investment? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, our deployment is, is, you know, I would say we're a, we're a 30 day deployment for a lot of customers who had their information readily available. If someone said, hey, I, I have, you know, three, I have three machines, for example, I, I want you to come out here and, and drop a PC on the floor running this. I don't even want to talk to my network yet. I just want to start collecting information. I'm going to tell you, hey, it's probably going to take us, a, uh, you know, one to three days to, you know, to talk to each one of these machines, just figuring out where everything's at in your PLC program, especially if it's undocumented. And, you know, there's a good chance that we've got you up and running with data collection in two to four weeks. So, uh, you know, again, we try to be very, very quick to market because we want to be able to respond to our, our customer base, you know, quickly. So, um, and to that point, uh, you guys are, are making it easy on us here. You know, I see the question, where are they placing screens and PCs? Um, so there's really, again, customer to customer. So ultimately, this level of detail is not probably required on the plant floor. Where we're finding it is sitting on the plant floor is the client that says, again, hey, I've got this cell that I want to start with. This is my low-hanging fruit. I want a quick deployment. I don't want to involve IT. I want to drop a PC on the floor and have all this information right here and just learn a whole bunch before we, you know, before we do anything. Um, that customer has usually got something on the floor. The other side of it is if you say, I don't want any hardware on my floor, I don't want to have to put, you know, a, a PC, you know, by every group of machines, we can, we can uh, network those PLCs and then bring that back to the, the main server where we're running the Indusoft application or some, you know, sub-server. You know, we have some customers say, hey, I don't really want to have this sit on my network. I want this one, or I don't want this to sit on my main server. I'm going to dedicate a PC in the front office to running this application, again, to kind of keep things clean. So uh, that customer is not putting equipment on their floor, uh, but they're keeping it in the front office. And then they may go to an Andon screen where, you know, they're pushing some information at, at a top level, you know, out to the operators that, you know, green is good, red is bad, big numbers, here's my OEE, or here's where I'm at from a productivity metric perspective. So, um, and as part of that survey that we'll send out, We'll kind of ask you to say, where do you want that information? How do you want to see it? Who do you want to see it? And that'll help us paint a picture to say, do you need PC hardware on your floor? Do you need it in your front office? Neither or both. So we can, you know, we'll, we'll, we identify that on kind of a case by case basis, but it really depends on the client. We have some who they love it. They love to the display on their floor. They love walking up to a machine and going, wow, this is awesome. You know, in, in some cases, we've been integrated into you know, turning it into a real simple machine HMI for them. And, you know, again, kind of the flexibility and use offerings where, you know, we just kill off their HMI completely on the machine and we have this be the interface to their equipment, um, especially when they're, they need to upgrade anyway. Maybe they don't have an HMI and they would need to upgrade anyway. Or, you know, again, we tie it back and we, we just have someone in the front office looking at this information. Great. Uh well, I don't see any more questions uh, that have come in, and we're right at the top of the hour, so that's uh, uh, perfect timing. Uh, oh, just got some feedback. Great answers. Thanks. Uh, you're, you're very welcome. Actually, I shouldn't say you're welcome. Uh, Rob, Rob did all the work there. 
Uh, Rob, Darren, thank you very much. I'd like to uh, thank you guys for, for putting this on and showing a, a really cool solution, how you've used Indusoft, uh, how you're really kind of solving a manufacturing uh, issue. And uh, I'd like to thank all the attendees uh, as well. And again, we're recording this webinar, so uh, you'll see either this webinar or the one that we do this afternoon uh, posted up in a few days. Uh, Follow-up surveys from us and uh, potentially from uh, Rob and, and Iris. Uh, so we'll, we'll uh, uh, at this, this point, uh, we're going to go ahead and end the webinar. But uh, Rob, thank you very much. Karen, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Thanks to everybody out there. Uh, and, and again, any questions for us, whether it be OEE, uh, you need help with machine control, or really just quality inspection in general, uh, lo love to have the opportunity to, to speak with anyone in the in the audience today. And, and I, I thank you again for all your time. Great. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.